Hi, how's it going? Welcome to my office here at Berkeley. Um, I hope you're doing well. Last time we were together, I walked you through a PowerPoint presentation that I had put together. This time, we're going to do something a little bit different. So have you heard of Howard Hughes? He was this American character um, who lived from 1905 to 1976. He made a huge amount of money through his efforts as an investor, an airplane pilot, an engineer, and also as a film director. Apparently, he was quite a bit of a character as well. <laughs> so I bring him up because one of the enduring parts of his legacy is his philanthropy. He funded the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Now, instead of being a foundation that gives out grants, the HHMI is an actual research institute. There's a physical building in Maryland. In addition, they also have an extensive set of faculty across major research universities who all work on questions exploring medical research. And in fact, we have a number of the HHMI investigators here at Berkeley on our campus. Now, additionally, in addition to the research, there is an educational mission to HHMI. There's a famous biologist named Sean Carroll, and by famous, I mean about as famous as biologists get, which, you know, is meh. <laughs> well, Sean Carroll, he talked the people at HHMI into creating many documentaries that are at the cutting edge of the science. Now, the Discovery Channel, National Geographic, and others, they hire filmmakers to make documentaries about scientists, about science. So they have artists um, representing the science and trying to convey science. But what HHMI has done is they've invested a lot of money into making documentaries that are actually envisioned and created by scientists about the science. I think these videos are an excellent way to get introduced to some of the topics that we cover in this class. So I'm going to have you watch a few of them over the course of this semester. Today, I've set you up to watch one about human evolution. The glitch here is that this is my primary research area. <laughs> so I've spent years of my life in the field in Eastern Africa looking for fossils, and consequently, I have a pretty I have pretty strong opinions about how the science is presented. And however much I admire and respect Sean Carroll, if it had been me in charge, I'd have done this video a little bit differently. <laughs> but thanks to Kaltura and B courses, I can. <laughs> so what we're going to do is watch the beginning of the video and then when it gets to where I think you'd be better off hearing some more recent research rather than the historical bits he focuses on. We're going to cut away and I'll talk a little bit more and show you some photos, introduce you to some other researchers, and then we'll go back and watch the rest of the HHMI video with Sean Carroll. And so with that, I pass you on to the HHMI video. <laughs> See you in a few minutes. Explaining the origins of key traits that distinguish species has long been one of biology's fundamental quests. That's especially true for our own species. If we look at humans as a biologist would any animal, certain features stand out. Our big brains, the way we get around on two legs instead of four, and the way we use our free hands to make tools. Each of those three traits marks an enormous difference between us and our primate relatives. But when did they evolve? And in what order? The quest to understand our past has revealed much about the evolution of these features, all of them milestones in the great transition from apes to humans. It was many years after Charles Darwin had published his theory of evolution that he finally addressed the question, what about us? He speculated that we are descended from a common ancestor we share with African apes. The hope was that 
some geologists or paleontologists would one day recover the fossils that would settle the question. Fossils are essential evidence when putting together an evolutionary history. But in Darwin's day, and for many decades after, few early human fossils had been found anywhere. Anthropologists Lewis and Mary Leakey thought Darwin was right about Africa. So they searched for early human fossils in places like Tanzania's Olduvai Gorge. Here, they found abundant stone tools. But for the longest time, the bones they sought eluded them. For almost three decades, all the Leakeys found were tools, tools, tools everywhere, but not their makers. But all that finally changed the morning of July 17th, 1959. On a hill Mary had walked by countless times, something caught her eye. Poking through the eroding sediment was a huge upper jaw. Together, she and Lewis carefully extracted bones from the skull of an early hominid. Geochemists analyzed the sediment layer it was buried in and determined this hominid had lived a stunning 1.76 million years ago. Remarkably, the very next year, the Leakeys made another discovery. They designated it Olduvai Hominid Number 7. It too was almost 1.8 million years old, but the recovered skull pieces and finger and wrist bones led them to conclude it was a separate species of early hominid. So there were at least two different evolving lineages of humans alive at this time. These discoveries helped swing the focus of human paleontology to Africa. Detailed casts of these and many other fossil finds are kept at the Human Evolution Research Center at the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Tim White, the center's director, has been involved with many of the important hominid discoveries of the past four decades. Clearly it was a hominid. I asked him what the current view is of the Leakey's first discoveries. Well, I guess after chasing the toolmaker for so many years, they initially thought, oh, we've found the toolmaker. But it turns out this large crest, the huge back teeth of this, show that it's on a side branch of human evolution. Probably not the toolmaker, but fortunately, the next discovery was Olduvai hominid number seven, with a cranium much larger in size and a face much smaller in size, and probably the maker of these very primitive stone tools from the very bottom of Olduvai Gorge. The early humans found at Olduvai were bipedal tool makers, with brains not as big as ours, but larger than those of modern chimps, our closest primate relatives. So all of these traits must have evolved between 1.8 million years ago and whenever the human and chimp line separated. You've just been introduced to Lewis and Mary Leakey, and also Tim White. Now, Professor White is a professor here at Berkeley. He's the current director of the Human Evolution Research Center, and he carries the torch of almost a century of human evolution research here at Berkeley. Now, I'm standing in front of an exhibit here on campus on the main floor of the Valley Life Sciences building. Now, when you are on campus, uh, come check it out sometime. Now, you'll get to see a reconstruction of a field. Uh, you get to see a reconstruction of a, of a field camp and table. Uh, there is a cast of Artie, of Australopithecus uh, afarensis. This is Lucy, the skeleton there. <laughs> and you see, you'll um, see her in the HHMI video in just a few minutes. And then there is also a slideshow of the Berkeley scientists who study human evolution and who have studied human evolution here. Now, two of the people in that video are Jackson and Zhao and, well, me. <laughs> We've been working at Olduvai Gorge much more recently than the Leakeys. And since we are um, the Berkeley side of that story, I want to tell you a little bit about our work. And so now I'm going to switch over to PowerPoint for that one. As you know from the HHMI video, Olduvai Gorge is in Tanzania, in Eastern Africa. Let's zoom in a little more. 
Let's zoom in a little more. And then a lot more. The gorge is like a rip in the eastern edge of the Serengeti. It exposes sediments that were deposited over the last two million years. So the Serengeti is to the west, which is left on your screen, and the Ngorongoro crater is the giant green mouse to the right. So we'll keep zooming in and spin around here a little bit. This is all done in Google Earth, and I absolutely love Google Earth. I use it a lot in my field research. And now I'm going to draw you into this one area here. So you can see moving into 3D from 2D. You can really get a sense of how it is this erosional gully in a very, very flat area, the Serengeti Plain. So over on the right of your screen, there are these faults, and I want to draw you into one of them in particular and kind of draw your attention to these orangish reddish colors in the sediment. So I'm going to pick the story up in a few minutes, right back on those red sediments. So draw your attention to that, and then let's move on. Jackson and Zhao and I co-direct a paleontological survey of the gorge. It's called the Oldify Vertebrate Paleontology Project. We take our team out to survey for newly eroded fossils coming out from the sediments. So you remember I pointed out those red sediments? Well, here they are from the ground perspective. And right in the middle of the screen, you'll see me standing there in my bright orange vest um, with another colleague on the project. It gives you a sense of scale. So here's Dr. and Zhao, um, Professor Jackson and Zhao. He's at Indiana University excavating an elephant, the mandible of an elephant. Those are teeth, things that look like loaves of bread. Uh, that elephant was deposited in those sediments about 1.8 million years ago. Those green tufts of plants, you can see them kind of just, um, just between Jackson and the other people in the picture. Those green plants are called oldify bushes, and they can get to be really big. In fact, oldify, the name oldify gorge, is supposed to actually be after the oldify bushes, but it was mispronounced by the colonialists when they first started working there. So really, oldify gorge should be called oldify gorge with a P. We record very precisely using GPS where each fossil is found. This enables us to keep very meticulous records of the dozens of fossils that we find each day in the field. Those GPS coordinates, coordinates enable us to plot within centimeters exactly where fossils were found. Databases and imagery like this, pretty standard practice in paleontology today. So each of those dots represents a plot of a fossil that we collected. We have all of the fossils inventoried into an online open access database that you're more than welcome to go check out. The URL is oldify-paleo.org. So all of the fossils that our project recovered are, are um, in this database, as well as all of the fossils that were collected by Lewis and Mary Leakey. This work takes a team, and a few Berkeley students have had the opportunity to learn from the professionals in Tanzania about fossil preparation and curation. On the right, you see past PhD a past PhD student in my lab. Her name's Whitney. She's now a data scientist, but during her grad school days, she went with Jackson and I to Olduvai. And here um, are people working in the lab out at Olduvai Gorge in one of the, the permanent buildings that are located um, at one of the base camps. On Whitney's second day at Olduvai, we decided to check out sediments exposed at this geological fault here. Let's see if I can show this here with my pointer. This is a fault right there, so the sediments go there, and then they pick up over here. So you can see how there's an offset. So let me show you the car. The yellow circle highlights our vehicle to give you a sense of scale. So we hopped out of the car and started down the hill, and just as we got to that red hill right here, um, Whitney stops and shouts out, Hey, this looks like the ulna of a hominid. I walked over and all I could say was, Yep, sure does. <laughs> the ulna is a bone in your forearm and the frag fragment that Whitney found is part of the wrist. Here's that fossil. It's the bone in the middle and it's darker because of the mineralization that happens during fossilization. 
Those are modern human bones on either side, modern human ulnae. This bone is over one million years in age, and yet it looks identical, essentially, to modern humans. So one of the things out of this, this story is just to point out that field paleontology, it's never that easy. Just that one time has it ever been that easy for someone to find such a rare fossil. But there you go. Okay, now let's uh, get you back to the HMI, HHMI video. And when did that happen? At that point, no one could say. But then Alan Wilson and colleagues here at Berkeley developed a revolutionary new way to use biomolecules, including DNA, to estimate the time of that split. Using this approach, researchers have estimated that humans and chimps have been evolving independently for almost seven million years. DNA tells us that our lineage goes back several million years before the Olduvai fossils. What DNA can't tell us is where and when the traits that distinguish us, like bipedality, first emerged. Only fossils and their ancient environments can address those questions. Eastern Africa is a fossil treasure trove because of the geological forces that have created the rift valleys that scar the region. Over the eons, volcanoes associated with this rifting regularly blanketed the region with ash that included radioactive elements, the steady decay of which allows geologists to accurately date sediment layers and the fossils within them. Paleontologist Don Johansson remembers vividly the first time he visited the Hadar region of Ethiopia. A thousand miles north of Olduvai, it has exposed sediments that are over a million years older. We drove up to the edge of this escarpment and it just unfolded and there it was. All of the sediments getting deeper and deeper and deeper. I could not wait to get down there. The driving force was find something. Uh, and then we walked out there. Johansson recently shared with fellow paleontologist Neil Shubin his memories of the day he discovered the first small bone fragment of one of the most famous fossil skeletons ever found. You know, my best recollection is that it was right in this area. And I looked at it and almost instantaneously said, that's a hominid, just a fragment of elbow that led to the skeleton. An international team of scientists helped Johansson recover almost half the bones of an individual who had lived 3.2 million years ago. They called her Lucy. Finding Lucy was really the first step in this very long process of description, investigation, evaluation, hypothesis testing, trying to figure out where in the world she sat, like we are on the tree, on the human family tree. Hey, sorry to interrupt again, but I just had to interject in this part. Now, our knowledge of Australopithecus afarensis, it's increased so much <coughs> since Lucy, and most of that's due to the spectacular research of two scientists leading research, research in the Afar these days. And both of them are Ethiopian paleontologists. So I want to introduce you to both of those um, just really quickly. The first one is Dr. Johannes Haile Selassie, and he is a curator at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Let me uh, play a little bit for you of him talking about his own work. Um, I'm a curator at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History next door. But most of what I do is paleontological field and laboratory research uh, in an attempt to address one profound question, a question that each of you may have in mind, very simple to spell out, but extremely difficult to answer. Where did we come from? I've been trying to address this question for the last 20 years 
by going to very remote, sometimes hostile, area in Eastern Africa in search of fossils that, that are, at least for us paleoanthropologists, our only clues to address the question of where we came from. Now, this area, this remote area that I'm talking about, is located in Ethiopia, which is right here. And the Afar Desert has been there for many, many years. It's a desert now, but millions of years ago, this place was very lush, green, a lot of water, and a lot of life. And that's why this early human ancestors used to live there as far as six million years ago. Now, you might wonder, why this place? Why don't we find fossils of our early human ancestors in Ohio Valley? Or why not in Death Valley in California? Well, unfortunately, they're not there. They were never there at this time. But this place, this Afar Desert of Ethiopia, owes all its paleoanthropological fame to one geological phenomenon known as plate tectonics. Now, the Earth that we live on sits on what we call plates. And these plates are not still. They move. They move in different directions. And there are three plates in the Eastern African region, like here, that are drifting apart from each other. Of course, some of these plates also collide against each other and create mountains. But at this specific place, these three plates, the Ethiopian plate, the Somali plate, and the Arabian plate, have been pulling apart from each other at least for the last 10 million years. Now, while they pull apart from each other, they're creating this huge crack, which runs all the way from Lebanon in the north all the way down to Mozambique. You can follow the rift all the way down to almost South Africa. And while it opens, what it's doing is it's exposing this long buried deposits with some signature of life from millions of years ago. And erosion plays its part, exposing this signatures of past life in the form of fossils. That's what we go look for in this part of the world. And of course, what you see here uh, on the lower uh, part is what's called the Afar Triple Junction, because there are three different plates in this region. And this is where we go all the time. I go to Ethiopia every year, not only because I have living relatives who live there, but it happens that all the long dead relatives of mine are also there. What a coincidence, right? At least for me, because whenever I go, I happen to see both, right? <laughs> so here is so that's Johannes Haile Selassie. He's actually um, from Berkeley. He got his PhD here many years ago. And now I also want to introduce you to Dr. Zarasanaya Lemsiged. He's a professor at the University of Chicago and he used to be at the Cal Academy, so just across the bay. And let me have him talk just for a little less than a minute for you. Humans by nature are the most curious species that you can have. Therefore, when we want to understand about our past a million, two million, three million, four million years ago. It's nothing but an extension in time of the type of curiosity that you have to know who your mom is, who her mom is, who her mom is, etc., etc., etc. So what we do as paleoanthropologists is only multiply that by hundreds and thousands of generations. Okay, so um, please go check them out and um, some of their amazing research that they've both been doing. So for now, though, um, I'll let you get back to the video. I won't interrupt again. Bye-bye. This is the Lucy skeleton found by Don Johansson in Ethiopia. She's 3.2 million years old and very representative of Australopithecus, the next earlier phase of human evolution. And they are bipeds, 
relatively small brains and no evidence so far of any stone tool use. So the stone tool use comes in much later than Lucy and her brethren. With early Homo. What can we tell about this creature from the fossils? When we look down here into the pelvis, we see evidence for bipedal walking, a commitment to walking on two legs that is very different from what we see among great apes. So when we look at a chimpanzee in the hip, we see the hip bones behind. They're long, they're tall, they're up the creature's back. Whereas in a human, our hip bone is much broader front to back, much shorter, and wrapping around the side. To put these muscles that control pelvic tilt during walking in an advantageous position. Then we can ask the question, is Lucy more like a human or more like a chimp? She has a very short blade on the pelvis, much more like a human. She has muscle attachments, much more like a human. It's a basically biped's architecture, and that's how we know that she walked on two legs. But there was a little bit of controversy. Even after that, some people said, well, how can we really be sure about that? And how can we be sure? Because we found these incredible things in northern Tanzania, older than Lucy, sandwiched between layers of volcanic ash. And it's not what you think. It's not bones. There was a volcanic eruption 3.75 million years ago. The volcanic ash came down on the Serengeti Plain. And animals walked across it. The ash hardened and was buried. In the 1970s, I was lucky enough to be with Mary Leakey out in this area, and we found the trails of hominid individuals left as they walked across that volcanic ash millions of years ago. It's an amazing, like a snapshot of time. They went for meters and meters and meters. There are no knuckle marks, no handprints, just bipedal footprints that look more or less like what you and I would leave on a beach. Human feet, we're all used to them, but they're really strange. Our big toe is in line with our other toes. We don't have a grasping big toe. We have arches, transverse and longitudinal in our feet. All these features are present at 3.75 million years ago in Australopithecus. So Australopithecus pushes us all the way back to 3.7 million years or older. She's small-brained, not using tools to our knowledge, but walking upright. So that's telling us that walking upright is yet still an earlier trait. What do we know about that? We didn't know very much about it because Lucy and her species only went back to 3.75. So to take the next step back in time, we had to find older fossils. Just 50 miles south of where Lucy was found, there are exposed rock layers reaching back six million years. This is where Tim White and a large international team of geologists, paleontologists, and archeologists have focused their combined efforts since the early 1980s. What we wanted to do was to plumb the unknown, to figure out what came before the Lucy species. For a decade, what they'd come for largely eluded them, until... A graduate student at the time, Johannes Haile Selassie, found two little pieces from the palm of the hand, just this bone here, and these little pieces he picked up and said, this looks like a hominid. <laughs> the excitement of this and other early finds quickly gave way to a disciplined search for more. And there was indeed much more to find. Hand, foot, arm, leg, teeth, skull, head to toe, we had coverage of a creature nobody had ever seen before. We nicknamed her Ardi for the genus Ardipithecus. The species is Ramidus. And it's really a skeleton that is representative of the earliest known phase of human evolution. And how old is she? 
She's 4.4 million years old. We know that because these bones were all found sandwiched between volcanic horizons, both dated to 4.4 million years ago. So that's more than a million years older than Lucy. It was stepping into that black hole beyond Lucy that nobody'd been able to step into before. Removing Artie from her four million year resting place was a real challenge. Her bones were ready to turn to dust. That little hill had to be excavated a millimeter at a time. We had to use chemical hardeners on her, extract her in plaster jackets, and then work on each bone under a binocular microscope with a needle to clean the encasing sediment from the soft bone underneath. But what we got as a result of that is a really unrivaled look at the anatomy of a very ancient hominid. We could see the muscle attachments on the finger bones. We could see the scratches on the teeth. It's beautiful anatomy. With some real surprises, especially below the neck. There was an extension in the lower pelvis that showed that she was a climber. In the foot, a large toe that stuck out to the side of the foot, the first time this is ever seen in a hominid, even though all other primates have this. She is this peculiar mosaic of traits, capable of bipedality on the ground, but also climbing abilities far superior to those seen in later Australopithecus. You couldn't possibly have expected this. Nobody could have expected it because you can't predict this from looking at chimps and humans and triangulating. Artie is neither a chimp nor is she a human. She is a mosaic 4.4 million years old. The step beyond Australopithecus, a glimpse into that first phase of hominid evolution. Buried along with Artie was fossil evidence of the habitat in which she lived and where bipedality evolved. It wasn't what anyone had been expecting. For a long time, scientists predicted that bipedality had evolved in a grassland. The savanna has always played a big role in people's speculations. And what we had with Artie was evidence from her body and her, indeed her chemistry, as well as evidence from her environment that showed she was not adapted to an open grassland savanna existence, even though she had already achieved bipedality. That evidence included tens of thousands of animal and plant fossils, indicating that she was living in a woodland setting, not an open African savanna. So bipedality evolved while our ancient ancestors were still spending time in the trees. Ardipithecus took away any doubt that bipedality was ancient. And it was so ancient that it preceded by over a million years, the expansion of the brain, the incorporation of stone tool technology We now have thousands of hominid fossils from the past six million years. They reveal several phases in the biological evolution of humans. You have an early phase, Artipithecus, whose anatomy allows it to climb in the woodlands and walk on two legs. We see Australopithecus as the next phase, Lucy a representative of this. It's a committed biped with a small brain, but still big teeth for chewing, big robust faces. Their niche has expanded beyond Artipithecus. They're in more open habitats. They're found throughout the African continent. And then the third phase of human evolution is our own genus, the genus Homo. And here we have a creature that really is a technological primate, depending more and more on culture. Stone tools allow early humans to compete first with scavengers and then with predators. They broaden their diets and ultimately their geographic range leaving Africa. Recently, in the Republic of Georgia, hominid fossils were discovered that are as old as the Olduvai fossils. They include the most complete early homo skull ever found. 
that is going to give us insight into the biology of our ancestors, the ancestors of Homo sapiens. And it's a great illustration of how paleontology is not a dead science. Paleontology is the science by which we learn about our past, how we became human. What that science shows is that, like all animals, we have a long evolutionary history. Just as four-legged animals evolved from fish ancestors and birds evolved from dinosaur ancestors over a series of small steps over a long geological time span, we evolved from small-brained quadrupedal apes over a long time span that is now well-documented in the fossil record 